Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. You probably first got to know Angela Johnson Reyes through her hilarious characters that went viral. Tammy the Snide Nail Tech and Mad TV's Bon Qui Qui, the fast food server who will cut you if you give her a complicated order. Angela is a comedian, an actress, a writer, and a mom, having welcomed her beautiful baby girl, Rosalie, along with her husband, Manuel Reyes. She is the author of the comedic memoir, Who Do I Think I Am, now out in paperback, and Angela's sixth comedy special entitled Say I Won't, which she produced on her own, is now on YouTube, and it is wonderful. Angela, welcome to Group Text. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Isn't it funny when someone reads your intro and you're like, I did all that? Yeah, no, seriously, I'll be like, when I hear people read stuff, I'm like, wait, I sound successful. That- I know, I'm the same way. It's like, why do I think I'm such a loser? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, I'm doing all right. But even just hearing you say mom, like it's so new for me that that's even weird going like, oh yeah. It's yeah. now it's now part of your bio. Yeah. It's Wild. weird. Wild. Are I you never having fun? Me. I never thought I would have a kid ever. And I changed my mind at 41. I was like, well, let's just give it a go. Let's, you know, I wanted to wait until I was considered geriatric pregnancy to make it adventurous, you know. Well, because it's not challenging enough. Right. Exactly. Are you enjoying it? I am. I am. And it's hard, but worth it, which all my friends used to say, they would be like, oh my gosh, like I have to wake up throughout the night. Then one has an ear infection. Then the other one has foot, hand, mouth disease, whatever that is, but it's so worth it. And I'd be like, oh my God, that does not sound worth it at all. But then it is, I look at her little smiling face in the morning and she's, you know, learning all these new things and it's so fun. It is. It's, it, it's, again, one of those things that you don't understand till you do it. Yeah, totally. But, but I'm interested. But let's talk about things, other things you're doing besides being mommy. You released your most recent special, your sixth, which is crazy. Say I Won't, this past spring, and this is hard to believe, it already has two million views yeah. on YouTube. I mean, congratulations. Why YouTube? You know, um, I... It's the platform that kicked it all off for me. You know, like my career started back in 2007 when this nail salon video blew up and I had no idea that it was going to change my life forever. And I ended up touring and my career just blew up from that. So it felt very full circle moment for me. This is a special that my husband and I produced ourselves. Um, It's beautiful. We filmed it at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. And it just felt fitting and full circle to bring it back to the platform that started my career for me. And the Ryman is like a big venue. It's huge. And it's historic. It's like Dolly Parton. Um, yeah. Ryman's Elvis. huge. Yeah. It's amazing. It's incredible. But, but you finance and produce this. What did, what did you do as the producer when the talent was behaving poorly? <laughs> you know, I'm, can we do that again? She's not, she's not really up to par. Did you ever want to lock yourself in your trailer so you had to run to the other side and let your and, and talk yourself down? Yeah. Well, that's the thing is I always would wonder, like, I would see like my friends that are like starring, producing, directing their own project. I'm like, wait, how did you do that? How did, how did you be here and then direct it over here too? Like how, what? Is that directing and acting thing at the same time that I always think is so complicated? Cause how do you judge yourself? I mean, the people who do it are super talented, but still I can't imagine having to yell action while you're standing in, on set and not pull yourself out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's what the ADs are for there. Yeah. Uh, what it, do you think that this and the making of your own specials, which seems to be a trend is really the future for touring comedians? Yeah. Listen, we have to take our careers into our own hands and especially as like the platforms are, it's crazy how now people, when they hear about your your stand-up comedy special, 
they now say, hey, when's your next Netflix special? Like the word Netflix goes with comedy special. Like people just assume Netflix means a special. Like it's the only place to go for a special. But we have so many options when Netflix can't put everybody on their platform and YouTube, it gives us the opportunity to do things ourselves in our own way to not have to take out jokes that we're asked to take out or anything like that. And, um, and it's free for our fans who have been supporting us for so long. It's free for new fans to find us and that's how we grow. And so I think it's super important for comedians and artists to take a risk on themselves invest in themselves because you never know what could happen and if nobody else is going to take a risk on you take it on yourself and see what happens this is your sixth special and i know from you know having a ringside seat with my mom people don't know how hard it is to have enough material for one special let alone six and especially when everything's living online yeah. What is your process? I mean, you had to do the sixth special. It's blowing up. And now you got to be sitting there and going, oh, shit. Now I got to go back on the road yeah. and come up with all new material. What's your process for that like? You know, um, I I put a lot of pressure on myself and I wait until I have anxiety and I'm super uncomfortable. And I'm like, I hate this. Why am I a comedian? What am I doing? And then the second I get on stage and I try something new and it works, then you go, oh, oh, wait. Yeah, okay, I, I can do this. I know how to do this. Why did I wait so long? Why didn't I start sooner? Why didn't I do that? I always do that. Never fails. It'll be like, like uh, what do they call it when you were in school and you would just study the day, the night before a test? Cram. Yeah, cram. That's what I, I do with my writing. I would be like, put it off because it's giving me anxiety. The, the daunting idea that I have to write a new hour, it's giving me anxiety. I'll put it off, put it off. And then when I get like close to the wire, then all of a sudden I'm like, all these jokes start coming out. Like it's not good for my my cortisol and my, but but it works so far for the past 16 years, it's been working for me. Um, my mom wrote constantly and we would find scraps of paper and stuff. Do you have a pad like next to your bed or do you talk into your phone? Do things just come to you during the day or do you, know, my mom also used to every day sit down and write. Oh, I love her. Yeah. Did Do you have that kind of a, a system? Cause people, some people don't, I know comedians who have said I have ideas and then I walk on stage and it just kind of comes. And then I have to go back and try and remember what I said. I have my notes folder in my phone and I'll write down just like a thought, like an idea. And then I'll write down, uh, like I actually will say out there, I will type out exactly how I'm going to say it just to, to get it in my memory before I go on stage. But I have like all of my, for the past, I don't know, years of just thoughts and notes and I keep it on my phone and I can go back to old specials that are out and I can see like how that joke started. Like this was where I was thinking. This was like the premise idea it was going to be like this. And then by the time it makes it to the special, it sounds totally different. But this is how it started right here in my phone. Well, my mother was never tech savvy. So thank God she <laughs> didn't do that on her phone because we would still be finding stuff. Um, now, you have had a varied career. You have been, let me see if I get this right a cheerleader, a model, an actress, an author, a sketch comic, a stand-up comedian. Now, these are a lot of lanes you're occupying. How do you describe yourself and keep cheerleader out of it? Because if you don't think we're not going back to you being an Oakland Raiderette, you are completely mistaken. Uh, jack of all trades, master of none. That's that's where I fall in line. I feel like I'm I'm a little bit good at a lot of things and good enough to get my foot in the door and keep people believing it for as long as I can. I always, th I always use um girl in a whirl. Mm. That's, That's a good one too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. In general, and I know I'm speaking very generally because I don't want people to get mad. You don't put comedian and NFL cheerleader in the same sentence. You know, and I don't want to offend any cheerleaders out there who consider themselves funny. 
How did you decide to become a Raiderette? Well, okay. That was never really my jam. Like I was a cheerleader growing up, but like competitive, like stunts, tumbling, like throw them in the air and flip me around. And I did all that kind of stuff. And the Raiderettes was very different. It was like sexy and beautiful, which was not my jam. I was kind of tomboy, but I wanted to be an actress and I was considering moving to Hollywood, but I would have never like made the actual jump to do it. It was too scary. And um, I had a friend who was a cheerleader for the Raiders and she was like, hey, you should come try out. And I was like, it's not really my jam. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to try out. And if I make the squad, I'm going to use that as my sign to move to Hollywood and pursue the entertainment industry. And if I don't make the squad, then I won't. I'll take acting out of my brain and I'll just be a massage therapist because that's the only other thing that I'm good at. And that was my thing. And so I made the squad. I couldn't believe it. I cheered for one year. We went to the Super Bowl that year. I came home from the Super Bowl and the very next weekend I packed up my room and I drove to LA because I, that was my sign. I kept my word to myself and I started from the ground up as an extra on friends. And then I worked my way up. It's funny though, because, you know, for someone who danced in front of hundreds of thousands of people in booty shorts and go-go boots, Right, right. Your comedy is very relatable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something that's unrelatable, something that's relatable. Totally. Um, and you work so clean. How did you, how did you decide this was your style? You know, I I feel like it was just my life. Like sure it's an exaggerated version of my life, but that's kind of just how I operated within my family, with the way I talk, the way I speak. I I was I kind of live uh, not blue, you know? And so it, it just lent itself into my comedy. I, I didn't have to try to be clean. I was just writing it in what felt naturally a natural way for me to write. And then it was like, Oh, you're a clean comic. And I'm like, Oh, I am. What is, what does that mean? Oh, cause you don't cuss or you don't talk about sex or whatever. And I was like, Oh, Okay. Yeah. Then I, I guess so. Because at the time when I started, I was in my twenties, um, super Christian. And like, I didn't want to like talk about sex or anything. Cause I was like embarrassed. And then now oh, I'm 41. I've evolved a little bit. And in my own life, now I would say it's more of a choice to not cuss on stage because I I know my brand and I know when people come to my show what they expect and what they're comfortable bringing their kids or bringing their grandparents and I love that and I respect that and so I kind of honor the the lane that I've paved for myself in that brand and I can I can keep the rest of the stuff for my my family and friends at home you just brought up religion. Um, it is really front and center in your life so much that God has even made it into your act. Yeah. <laughs> Were you ever concerned that mentioning faith and religion might turn audiences away? In the beginning, no, I didn't think about it because again, I was just, I was taught you write from your life. The more personal you can make it, the, the more likely it is that people will accept it and it won't be hacky because it's personal to you. So I would just write everything about my life. And then I found that there was an audience that related to that part of my life. And so it's really about where you choose to look and listen. And then, um, then I, I would definitely hear people be like, they're upset because they don't relate to whatever I was saying about God or, and then there's people who are Christian that didn't like my jokes because they didn't like that I was making fun of Christianity, but we have to make fun of ourselves. So every, everybody's part of it. You know, I make fun of myself for being Latina, for being Christian, for being married, for like, I'm going to make fun of all the things. So if you're offended by that, that's okay. You could deal with that. As they always say, we've always said in my family, everybody's something. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's like, um, you, you wrote, maybe God does have this divine plan over my life, but he's not up there pulling strings like a puppet master. And you started to talk about that just now, about people being offended. Because it's a very unique perspective. Have you gotten, it seems like, pushback from institutions about your idea of free will doctrine? Yeah. 
I definitely, like I said, been evolving over the years in my faith from what I used to believe and preach to where I am now. That's definitely a more open and inclusive faith. And, um, I, for sure pushes buttons for, it would have pushed my buttons, the version of me from 20 years ago, I probably would have been offended by, oh, well, that's not how you do it. That's not the right way to do it. And then I've gotten to a place where I'm like, there's not really a right way to do it. Just love God, love people. Do you think that's just mileage, as I like to call it, meaning living long enough to have perspective? You got miles on you? You would think, but then there's people like my dad who has lots of miles, but he's boots dug in deep. And he's like, nah, there's no such thing as dinosaurs. And I'm like, oh, okay. They're not in the Bible. So there's no dinosaurs. I'm like, oh, okay. So I guess, I guess he's not going to wear the T-Rex suit to play with your daughter. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Did you see that there was just a T-Rex race? It was hilarious. No. Um, I read your book, Do Do I Think I Am, and I loved it. You write candidly, and you just talked about that a little bit, about being, and I'm quoting this, a chola in San Jose. And you said, I don't mean to keep quoting you, but it's very interesting. Cholas are proud, strong women who know who they are and aren't afraid to show you, sometimes very close to your face. Um, Explain this to my listeners. So I grew up wanting to be a tough girl, wanting to be this chola i'm not afraid of anybody i'll fight you if i have to like i will get in your face and honestly it was like something that i admired this bravery and boldness and i think it's something that i wished that i had and i wished i could be ultimately it wasn't i i couldn't pull it off i i'm not really a fighter i'm not i hate confrontation i'm wait i'm gonna stop you there But comedians are fighters. You go out on a stage and basically fight for your life. So the fact that you don't think of yourself that way, yet in a lot of ways, that's what you do for a living, I think is an interesting conflict. That that is interesting. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, well, you know, psych 101. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. Maybe it's because... It's a sea of people. And so I'm like blinded by there's not one individual person that I'm looking in the face and having a confrontation with. I don't know what it is. There is just something about once I I feel like somebody's offended by something that I've said, I'm like, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Like, I don't know what it is. I, I get like that. And I think that's why in even in my material i i never try to offend people even though i do all the time it's not like my goal to like ruffle feathers let me see how many feathers i can ruffle because that makes me uncomfortable i'm like if feathers get ruffled as a byproduct well sorry you feel that way but yeah it makes me uncomfortable it's interesting because i'm just thinking about past conversations that i've had with my mom and about my mom and you reminded me in the sense of who she was off stage was vastly different than who she was on stage. How did she do it? How did, how was she able to just be so confident on stage and not care what people thought, you know? Um, which is funny because she totally cared what people thought in real life. She, Mm -hmm. she was incredibly insecure. Um, like how we all do. Yeah. You just swallow and fake it. Yeah. And just pretend. I mean, I'm the same way. I can talk to a camera all day, put me in, a, in front of a, a room full of people, and I, I want to crawl under the table. People are like, how do you talk to I'm like, I, I don't know. But, and when I have to do that kind of stuff, I just, I hate the term, but I just man up and do it. Yeah. And suddenly you're like, oh, I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I feel like it's the same thing with like reading negative internet comments. Like I would love to be the person that's like... <laughs> I don't care about that. None of that phases me. It doesn't even get under my skin. But ooh, let me tell you, I'll, I'll read a couple every now and then. I'll be like, ooh, you got me. But then there's some that I'm like, oh, please, that doesn't even apply to me. But there's some times that I can read something negative and I'm like, oh, it got me. It's it's in here. How do I get it out? 
Yeah, my whole thing is, why don't you like me? Yeah. And if you only really knew me, the person you see on TV isn't the person that I am. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about your parents again for a sec, because it's interesting that they were not taught Spanish. No. By their parents in an effort to assimilate them. And that your mom's name is Susan, because they felt that Hispanic names were associated with poverty. Did you feel kind of, because I'm assuming that you knew your grandparents. Yes. So did you feel caught kind of between these two words, especially wanting to sort of feel like, and I'm using your word, a chola? Absolutely. I, my grandparents spoke Spanish, but the kids didn't. So I grew up listening to my grandma speak Spanish on the phone, talking to her sisters, watching her sitting in her rocking chair, watching her programs, her stories that were all in Spanish, all her little Mexican game shows that she would watch. So I grew up around it, but not from my mom, just from my grandmother. And I always wanted that part of my culture, but I, I wasn't taught and I didn't, I didn't learn myself. I mean, I tried, I got Rosetta Stone, but I'm still on level one and I've had it for 17 years. It's ridiculous. Mine, I grew up in LA and mine is just as bad. Um, let's talk about Tammy, which is crazy. A hundred million views. Lots the, of views. The, the snide nail lady. Um, what, is there a real Tammy or is she a, a, a compilation? She's a compilation, but there is a real Tammy. The first nail salon that everything that I say in that nail salon joke has been said to me. And the first nail salon, my mom took me when I was 12 years old. And the, the lady who did my nails, she basically watched me grow up. And I remember when I came back as a cheerleader in Oakland Raiderette. Now, granted, I started going to this lady when I was 12 and now I'm an Oakland Raiderette and I brought her my headshot so she can put it up on her wall in her wow. salon. And what she said to me when she saw my picture, she said, I knew the first time you walk in here, you look like Mado cheerleader, something. And she was telling me that she saw it in me. She knew it. As soon as I walked in when I was 12 years old, that I was going to be a model or a cheerleader or something. And so I add that into my bit, into my story. So everything that I say has been said to me by either Tammy, the lady who I grew up doing my nails with, or any of or other of the nail salon ladies that I've been to, or the guys. I used to go to a guy named John, but he called himself Don Juan John. <laughs> and he was great. And he was hilarious. He was funny. He was sassy. He'd do my nails and like blow his breath in my face and be like, do I smell like fish? I just ate my lunch. And he would just, <laughs> he would just be so silly with me. And I really had a relationship with my my nail techs. And so everything that I say in that joke has been said to me by somebody that I know who does my nails. I love that. And another vile character who actually originated on Mad TV. And there is a whole generation that does not know what Mad TV was or right. In Living Color or any of these kind of, you know, groundbreaking shows, even the, the original Chappelle show. Um, Bon Qui Qui. Yes. The best. <laughs> How did she come about? So Bon Qui Qui is a mix of a few different people. The one is I went through a Burger King drive through when I was about 16 or 17 years old in Memphis, Tennessee. And the girl who was working the drive through was out of this world, unreal. I couldn't believe the customer service that I was receiving. It was very much like, what? No, no, you can't. No, it was, I had never experienced somebody like that in customer service. And I remembered it from when I was a teenager. And most of Bonquigui's personality was my brother. He was my <laughs> great friend. My brother is hilarious. At the time, he was not sober. He was a hot mess. And he would say whatever he wanted to say. He had no filter. He was very funny, very sassy. And he's a trendsetter. So he would start saying a new word. And then all his coworkers would start saying it. He works at the hair salon. He would start laughing a new way. And next thing you know, all the hairstylists, they all start laughing the way he laughs. Like, mm-hmm, <laughs> 
and he he was just a trendsetter and that's kind of who bong quickly was she is this she has her own hairstyle that she picks she has her own words the way she says them and next thing you know everybody starts saying security or everybody starts saying rude whatever it is that she says she became this trendsetter and that's kind of who my brother always had been and so a lot of times he would say something and i'd be like oh my gosh that's going in bong quickly's mouth i'm gonna have her say that in my next sketch you know, I wonder where is she now? Does she take enough me time? I'm, I'm a little. Yeah, where do you, where is she now? She's taking her me time right now for sure. I think you should bring her back as a mom. Oh my gosh, could you imagine Bon Quigui as a mom? Be I hilarious. I can't. Dead. I cannot even. It's that would be so funny. Let's talk a little about you now being a mom. You've been married for twelve years. Yep. Uh, you welcomed your first child. How are you going to incorporate this into a life on the road for both of you? And how are you going to, have you already started to think about material that involves being a new mom? Um, I have to, I had to start thinking about material because I booked shows too soon is what I did. So um, I have my first show coming up pretty soon. I did my first set last night. Well, how old, well, how old is Rosalie? Two and a half months. Two, oh man, you are quick. That's okay. My my, I was back on the red carpet. Let's see. I had him December first, and I was back on for the Golden Globe. So it was it was maybe eight weeks. Whoa. Maybe. Wow. Good for you. I well, at that at that time you had not that you had to people did take maternity leave, but I was so scared someone else was going to get my job. Sure, I get it. And for me, I was just. I thought in advance, I was like, oh, this should be fine. I had no idea what I was in for. Now, looking back, I'm like, oh, I wish I would have given myself at least one more month, maybe two even. But I'm glad I did it the way I did because it's one of those where you rip the Band-Aid off. Like, I feel like if I would have waited too long, then I would have become like a statue and like, no, I can't. And then the anxiety really would have got me. So it's probably good that I planned it too soon, but I have started thinking about new material. I just went up last night for the first time trying some of these thoughts and um, it's that balance of, I want to share my new life with people. And at the same time, I don't want my whole new material to just be all about mom stuff, you know? And um, so I'm, I'm trying to like, find that balance. What, what am I learning in motherhood? Not just about being a mom, but like about myself. That's like a woman, any woman can relate to this, but I discovered it because I was a mom. And then some of it is very mom center. It's very my boobs, you know, breastfeeding. And one of them makes lots of milk. The other one doesn't like one of them graduated summa cum laude. The other one's working on her GED. It's like, <laughs> what is happening here? And I'm trying to figure it all out. And and they hurt. I have silver nipple caps on right now. And they're heavy. Like, I can't jump. God forbid I walk briskly somewhere. It's just, it hurts. <laughs> how did it feel? How many steps onto the stage did you have to take physically before you went, oh, this feels like home? Um, Pretty, you know, what's funny. Uh, pretty much as soon as she started announcing my name and I started walking, I was like, oh, I remember this walk. I know how to do this. Isn't and that then, a great feeling? Oh, it was so good. And they were such a warm audience. They didn't know I was coming. It was a surprise. And they were so warm and receptive. And I'm like, okay, even if you're giving me like generous laughs, I don't care. I will accept them because I needed this warm welcome back. So thank you. Uh, before I let you go, though, you in your special mentioned that you love crime shows. I am a full on junkie. My mom was a full on junkie. So this is a, this is the hardest question I'm going to ask you. So please take it seriously. If you were stranded on a desert island with only one crime show to watch, what would it be? Okay, I have to say Law and Order SBU. Oh. Oh, SVU. I'd go with original. Original. Okay. Wow. Okay. I'd go OG. Are you a fan of the, they brought it back and where it's at now? The OG regular law and order. It's my least favorite one. I'll be honest. I'm, yeah, not, I'm not, ha I'm not happy with it. Yeah. Go the classics. Yes. Sure. Oh, like I said, tr law and order OG. Yeah. 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 I, I would have to go SVU. Mariska is my girl. Um, 
And you have 24 seasons to choose from and watch from the beginning over and over. I just finished binging Chicago PD. That was a new one for me. I started in my third trimester and I got through all 10 seasons just like two days ago. And now I'm sad because I actually miss the characters in my life. I'm gonna have to try um, Chicago PD. I haven't watched that one. It's gritty. It like grittier than Law and Order SVU. Like they be they be doing stuff that's illegal. You know, they blur the lines a little bit in the Chicago PD. But I love it. The character's boy. Oh my gosh, he's my favorite. And that's one thing that I noticed too is like, I don't know if it's where I'm at in my age, but there's like all these young hot detectives on the show and they don't do it for me. You know who does it for me? Voight. Voight in his what? 60s with his little limp when he walks. Like it's like, he's too tired for this. That he gets me. I, I love me some Voight. I, 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 God, you and I are like one in the same with our crime shows. I just, never enough. Never enough. I'm never, never enough. Angela Johnson Reyes, your new special Say I Won't is available right now on YouTube. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs>